major global talking point. Uh, it's clearly on the agenda here in many of the discussions around Davos and on the panel here today. Uh, today with me we have Joanne Lippmann, a uh, journalist uh, most recently at USA Today and author of That's What She Said, which is coming out on Tuesday for all uh, in a bookstore, hopefully near you. And we have Gary Barker, who is CEO and founder of ProMundo. Uh, there are two men and one woman on this panel. Uh, some people might ask whether that's the right ratio, so let's ask it. Is that the right ratio? I I'm delighted, actually, to have men on the panel, men in the audience, men watching us. A and the reason is, actually, the subtitle of my book, That's What She Said, is what men need to know and women need to tell them about working together. And the, the reason that I wrote the book and the reason why I think that this, um, this moment has exploded in the way it has um, is because all of the issues that create an environment that at, it, that at its extreme lead to sexual harassment and assault that we've been hearing about, all of those issues um, that lead to that are the things that women face every single day. So not every woman has been sexually assaulted at work, but every woman, every woman in this room, every woman watching knows what it feels like to be marginalized, ignored, interrupted, underestimated, disrespected. And, um, and the issue is that women actually talk about these issues amongst ourselves all of the time. And it's been going on for years that we talk to ourselves, we have books, we have conferences. That's all terrific, but it's half of a conversation. And if women only talk to ourselves, 50% of a conversation can only lead, at best, to 50% of a solution. So if we really want to close the gender gap, what we really need is to bring men into the conversation. And um, the book, that's what she said, is about um, how do we bring men in, what are some strategies that men can employ. Um, but it's also, I think, in this particular moment, the reason why um, uh, this has exploded. And I think it's, it's, it could be a positive outcome uh, from the sexual harassment scandals is that we do have men who are suddenly aware and engaged in the issue and really want to change it. So this, I think, could be a very positive outcome. And I'm delighted to be on a panel with two men. <laughs> right. Gary, you've been uh, working, uh, Promunda has been working in this field, uh, evolving manhood for the last 20 years. Uh, you're the founder of the organization. Uh, some might say it's quite a strange calling. Mm. How did you, why did you choose this as, a, as an area in which to create a startup, I guess? Yeah, that is a good point. I mean, when I present my passport and if they ask in a given country, what do you do for a living? And I said, I try to overcome patriarchy from within. <laughs> it's kind of, a, it's not a conversation starter with most border guards. Um, but I think whether, so I grew up in Houston, Texas, witnessed a school shooting, saw what versions of manhood meant for myself and other young men, and said there's something that doesn't quite work here. And listening to girlfriends, friend girls, all had stories of the kind of harassment that is part of, unfortunately, the daily experience of women and girls. Years later, it, working in the reproductive health and sexual health field, it was kind of, we didn't really have a conversation with men. The, this amazing feminist revolution changing women's lives but it was as if men were we, the, the bringers of harm, but there was no conversation of what stake might we as men have either in repeating this, so we kind of perpetuate patriarchy all the time, but what was the stake that men could have in also trying to be allies with women to overcome it? And so Promundo started with that premise that we, certainly we need men in, on board with gender equality and ending sexual harassment because it's right. That should be enough. The sentence should end right there. Men, you should do this because it's the right thing to do. And then we can say, well, it's also right because actually your business does better and countries thrive. And, but there's also, and we've now done data in many countries on this, that men who believe in a more and live a more equitable version of what it means to be men are healthier, happier men. So we have a stake in this not only because it's right for women and girls and it's right for the world, but I think increasingly we find that this conversation allows men to embrace a version of manhood that it allows us to be who we want to be so kind of closer to our truer selves. So at the end of a conversation with that border guard, I've convinced him 
that actually this is in his interest to embrace gender equality and overcome patriarchy. At least that's where I try to get. We have data to back it up, and I'll share that later. Great. Uh, Joanne, that's what she said is a very timely book. And uh, uh, to that extent, you've been lucky. And at the same time, you've been at it for quite a while. Uh, why this topic? Right, so actually I've been working on the book for three years. So it, it's not a reaction to the sexual harassment issues that came up, but the reason I've been working on it is, you know, I, I grew up in I, the first 20 plus years of my career, I spent at the Wall Street Journal, and most of my career I have been surrounded by men, working with men, writing about men, um, and the guys who I worked with, you know, these are good guys. These are men who actually would want to be part of the solution, who want to be allies with women. But because they haven't been part of this conversation, they're, you know, and, and women haven't included them in the conversation, so they've been sort of left out. So you have these good guys who are our potential allies, um, who really are essentially clueless about the, uh, a lot of the issues that women face. There's actually research on this catalyst, um, of the nonprofit organization, actually interviewed men a few years ago and found and said, what are the barriers to you becoming a champion for women? For women? And more than half, it was 51%, said it was actually lack of knowledge about what the issues actually are, which is astonishing as a woman because, again, these things are in our face every day, 100 times a day, and we talk about them all the time. The, the other thing that the men said, and I think this is really important, is um, a vast majority, something like 74% of the men who were interviewed said it was fear. They had the fear yeah. of saying something wrong, but also the fear of being embarrassed, of losing status among yeah. other men. And that's incredibly important. That's the piece of this kind of cultural issue that we really need to get over and that I think that you're working with as well. 20 years you've been at it. Uh, what have you learned over that period about, this, about the nature of manhood? Yeah. I mean, one is that it's, um, it's a pretty fragile armor. I mean, it's, it's quite brittle. If we can get men starting a conversation, around that, I think the issue of fear, right? We are part of this way that we're raised to be men is that we don't stop and question what it means. And that we're, we're, being, we're fearful of being judged by other men of, do we live up to this idealized version of what it means to be a man? And all of us will have to acknowledge that we're not quite as strong or as virile or haven't had as much sex as we have. You know, part of it is this illusion of who we are as men. Part of what we try to do in a group setting is make it safe for guys to go, yeah, it's not quite working out the way that I thought it did. There are aspects of it that, or I'm fearful of what happens about this, or I'm expecting a child and I'm scared out of my wits of whether you know, we've got enough income or I can be a good parent or a good partner and all the rest. So one is creating that safe space that men can talk about this stuff. It's okay to and we don't lose face and status. Mm -hmm. The other is to try to change the rules around men. So if we, if, a, if in countries where men have been ignored, for example, in a prenatal visit, but we have 80% of men in Brazil coming to that prenatal visit, training a healthcare worker to say, talk to him, say we want him there, invite him to come back to do that HIV testing that he's otherwise not done. And if we change the world around men, we find that we get them to change. Parental leave stuff that the Scandinavian countries have done to say, we offer it to you, we expect you to take it. And a boss who comes and says, I know you're expecting, you've got three months leave, shakes your hand and says, I expect you to take the leave. Versus no, you know, no hard worker would actually take the leave even if we offer it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that, that changing the rules making it safe, and like your book does, identifying the men who already buy into this. Any setting we do this, so we work in low-income areas of Brazil, the US, parts of South Asia, the Middle East, we find the men who already believe in this, who are kind of already on our side. And no matter where we've done this, in some of the most conservative places, there are already men who get this. So another part is turning up the volume of their voices to say, look, there's men who look like you, who believe in this, who are doing it, who are showing the way and engaging them as kind of our first point of contact. I think that's so important. Yeah. Actually, what I, what I did in my report, I interviewed hundreds of people, but I actually went and sought out men 
who were trying to close the gender gap. And I talked to them about, you know, what are the things, what are your frustrations, what perplexes you about your female colleagues, and what might be some strategies um, that you've employed successfully uh, to try and close the gap. And, and that has been remark you know, the, the remarkably successful for a lot of men um, because once they become aware of some of these issues, things that, th there are things that once you see them, you cannot unsee them. So, you know, as a for instance, um, women, the research shows, are interrupted three times more often than men are. And um, this, this goes for women of all levels, by the way. There's been research done on the Supreme Court. Female Supreme Court justices are interrupted three times more frequently than male Supreme Court justices. Christine Lagarde here at Davos last year actually yeah. talked about this, how men sort of don't pay attention in a meeting when a woman is speaking. Um, but, you know, so, so for example, I talked to a very successful uh, television writer who, who realized that in his writer's room, he was a television producer of The Shield and of The Walking Dead, and uh, he said in the writer's room, he was realizing that women who had ideas were failing. None of their ideas were coming through. And he said it took him a little while, but he suddenly it clicked for him. What was happening is every time they tried to pitch an idea, the men in the room interrupted them. And so he created a new rule. The new rule was no interruptions for anyone while you're pitching, men or women. And uh, suddenly, after he did that, um, the women's ideas started coming through. The women started to succeed again. Um, you know, one other thing that uh, um, a number of men talked to me about is, you know, when women make up less than a third of, of a group, which is very, very typical in, certainly in most corporate settings, um, their voices tend to not be heard. And I think every woman knows that feeling where you speak up and you have an idea, it's, it's like kind of a good idea, and it's crickets. Right? Nothing. Nobody seems to hear it. And then a man repeats it two minutes later and suddenly, like, Bob's a genius. Um, and he gets the credit. Um, and so the men who realize this um, tell me that now what they do, they very consciously, and by the way, you don't have to be a boss. You just have to be a colleague, right? The men who have realized this tell me they now listen for that. And when that happens, they amplify the woman's point. They repeat it. They say, oh, Olivia, you made a great point. They repeat the point. And that does two things. It, first of all, it keeps the idea alive instead of the idea dying away. And secondly, it gives credit where it's due. And, and little things like this, um, again, they make an enormous difference in the life and livelihood of women. Let me interrupt you there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I, I do actually want to come back and talk about some practical, some other practical things that yeah. that uh, that men and others can do uh, in the workplace and at home. What I'd like to ask about, though, is how, uh, uh, with the Me Too movement last year and all of the discussion that's happening, it seems that this is an extremely widespread problem. It's a spectrum, of course. You've got yeah. sexual assault down one, uh, down the very severe end, all the way through to unconscious bias and social structures that create the kind of envir work environments that you're talking about. How widespread is this as a... As a so we've, we've just done a survey last year, representative sample of 18 to 30 year olds in the US, the UK, and Mexico and found that one in five to one in, one in three had carried out some kind of harassing or bullying behavior against women or girls or against other men in the last month. So only wow. in the last month. And that's self-reported. Self-reported stuff, but we practiced a lot of what the best way we could ask those questions. You could probably guess that some of that's underreported, but that's already astounding and frightening. So how do you ask that question? So we'll, what we'll say is, in the last month, have you done one of these things? We won't call it harassment, or we'll have a list of behaviors such that such you've as? done, such as posting a picture of a girl um, that you didn't ask her permission, such as a comment about her body. So we won't use harassment necessarily, but the description of that behavior, and guys will say yes. Um, so the, you know, we think that's probably underreported, but it's already quite high. And then the next thing we did with the data is to say, so which young men, what factors? Education level didn't matter, income level didn't matter, ethnicity didn't matter, urban rural didn't matter. The single most strongest factor that came out was how much you believed in a series of 17 attitude questions that we call the man box. So how much you believe in a version of men are in charge, that's the way the world is, I have to use strength to show who's in charge. 
that tough guy version of manhood, the more you believed in that, the more likely you were to report one of these harassments. And the, the chart basically goes like that. The most, if you're in the highest quintile of being in that box. If you're a Rambo, If you're, you're 10 man. times likely to do it. So the point is, you know, we need to in this Me Too moment, and it is a tremendous moment. But if all we think we need to do is to make lists of men who've harassed, and if we think it's just a handful of men at the top, we've missed the broader question. So, I mean, I think, in, and you said this as well, sexual harassment is a symptom of gender inequality. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to be careful that we don't just focus on the symptom, but say it's the whole package that we need to do. And so we also believe that what we've got to do to prevent it and keep it from happening is, yes, adequate reporting and protection of women who report it, that we take seriously women's accounts. But we've also got to go way upstream and have conversations with our sons. We've got to do adequate hiring so there's enough women in any workplace well, that it feels. Do sorry, I, do, do yeah, I have a long list there, yeah, but I can, yeah, you okay, can interrupt sorry. me. It's so right. we're going to come back again because yeah. at the end of it, we're going to sure. we're gonna have a list of things to do yeah, for men and we'll for women. I, I'd like to ask you, Joanne, about some of the, the data points that you discovered when you were doing the research for your book. Sure. Well, there's a ton, but I mean, I, to your point, this starts so young. It yeah. starts very, very young. And, 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 you know, we've all heard about unconscious bias and how we have these biases deep within us that we don't even know about. Yeah. Men have them as well as women have them. Um, uh, and and um, so, but these things start very, very young. So, for example, um, one of the things I found out was that um, mothers of infants routinely will overestimate how quickly their sons learn how to crawl, but they underestimate how quickly their daughters learn how to crawl. Um, you go up to the two-year-old age. Google has crunched the data on this and has found that parents who put the question about their two-year-olds, who ask Google, is my child a genius? Two and a half times more likely to ask it about a boy than they are about a girl. You go to first grade. Um, there was a really interesting t uh, study done about um, math. OK, so math seems like it should be black and white. They had first graders take a math test. It was graded by teachers, all of whom were female, by the way. Um, the math test, the first set was with no names. It was uh, anonymous. And when the math tests had no names on them, the girls outscored the boys. Then they put the names back on. When the names were on, the boys outscored the girls. And this is in math. That's in math? In math. And so the boys were getting sort of credits, you know, partial credit. They were getting the benefit of the doubt, and the girls were not. And, and this goes all the way up at every grade level. By the time you get to college, a girl needs to have a B in order to be seen. I mean, a girl needs to have an A in order to be seen on level as a boy with a B. Um, there's been some research in uh, the workplace that shows that women need to be two and a half times more competent um, than a man to be seen as the equal of that man. So, and so again, it starts literally from birth. And, uh, and so these are the kinds of things that we really need to start. This, is, this isn't something that we can just fix in the workplace. It's not something we can fix by weeding out the bad apples at work. This is something that starts at home early. It starts in schools. And we need to kind of educate our kids and our parents um, and, and start this at home before it gets to the point where we have created this environment where at the extreme we can have these sorts of um, incidents that we've been writing and talking yeah. about now. I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, um, the, the, the nature of feminism because uh, clearly we are now entering a whole new, a whole new phase. Uh, if you take the, the, I guess the first wave of feminism was the, the, the suffragettes, second wave of feminism in the 1970s, and now, and then things seem to have gone off the rails a little bit. Are we in a, is this going to be a very practical period, or is it, uh, you know, will we find ourselves, are things going to change in the next five or ten years? Will my, will my children and my children's children live in a, in a different world for women? I mean, it's already changing. You know, the last 20 years in terms of women's participation in the workplace in many parts of the world, advances in girls' education around the world, it's already, the shift is there. You know, I think the, the holdout, and which is, uh, you know, I think your book is touching on it, is how do we get men on board with this? And so if, and I, and I think, and men to realize that our lives are going to get better with this as well, is I think, the, let's take the issue of caregiving. So while we need to do all the push to get women in the workplace, we also need, 
men to do our share of the work at home. Women do, on average, three times the amount of, around the world, three times the amount of daily care of children, elderly, and our houses, our homes. Little recognition for that. We know what that means in women's lives. The changes when men start to do half of this, when men are hands-on caregivers, when we get men into caregiving professions, we also see a shift in men being more likely to listen, care for their own health, worry about, have the connections with others that make our lives much more interesting. So I think part of this shift does have to be time to bring men along with this. And we better be really careful that it's not men stepping up and go, oh yeah, let me, let me now drive this feminist revolution now. I think the other part is to say, we need both men listening in that meeting, but also saying, we're following what the women's rights movement started with this. We're with you at the Women's March to say, give us some ideas on where we should go, but we're also finding a stake that men have, that our lives get better as we embrace this. Yeah. I do think yeah. it's a great question of will it last, yeah. right? Because we're in a great moment now, um, and there's this awareness among men, there's awareness among all of us, um, and it's being taken seriously in the media. Um, you know, I think back to, you know, when Bill Cosby uh, was first, um, the reporting on Bill Cosby, who was drugging and sexually abusing women, yeah. was primarily on the entertainment pages. Yeah. And you think about now, um, and and uh, all credit and kudos to the New York Times and the New Yorker for getting that Harvey Weinstein story out, getting that on the front page, and, and putting this out there not as an entertainment story, but as a story about society and how society needs to change. And so, so um, however, that all that said, I think there's a serious question about will it last? Because in 1991, um, Anita Hill, uh, was the first person who brought the yeah. phrase sexual harassment into the popular vernacular. Uh, those of us who started you know, in the workplace before then didn't really think of that phrase. There was, you know, if, if sexual harassment meant you know, rape in the workplace, it, the, the way, it, so she kind of, the modern sexual harassment was brought up by Anita Hill in 1991, but we see here we are more than 25 years later and so much has not changed. And so, you know, my hope is that we can hold on to this moment and yeah. propel it. Uh, but I, I think it is probably too soon to have a definitive answer on that. Okay, I've got my pad out. We've got five minutes left. And we're going to have a list of things to do for men and women in the workplace and at home. So let's start with men in the workplace. And we'll... Sure. We'll start with you, Gary. Yeah, what do we need to do? Well, I mean, I can start a little bit with what not to do. The 45-minute PowerPoint on don't harass and why it <laughs> causes harm at the workplace doesn't work. Yeah. So we know that the conversation does have to be about what manhood means, how we interact, and very practical. So I think the kind of listening activities you do, we do an activity with young men called the talking stick where you wait for the other to speak. So you actually hold an object and wait for the person and you can't interrupt until they have passed it on. So trying to make active listening part of it. Parental leave, shifting the dynamic and saying, we expect men to do as much of the, the caregiving at home and have a life beyond the workplace that we do. That, that, and we support women in doing that as well. I think that definitely has to be there. Um, I think quotas are not a bad thing. Businesses often react and push back on those, but I do think when you do the Norway model of 40% women on a board, the kind of thing that Iceland's just passed about looking at your pay and making sure you're off in equal pay. I think those are things that make men sort of look up and go, oh, I'm being made to take equality seriously and I don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. Parent training is a key one. Getting this into schools, coaches, religious leaders, others who shape everyday manhood, those folks that we train to be the deliverers of this message, we find that it works. And again, keeping the discussion on, it's about the manhood, stupid. I would say is kind of our would be our slogan. Okay, uh, in the workplace. Sure. Men and women. Sure. Yes. First of all, all of the above. Um, and we talked about no interruptions. We talked about amplification. Yeah. There are things that you can do um, um, in the management. Those who have managerial uh, responsibility. Um, we kind of all know that you should have a mixed slate of people to interview yeah. for job openings. It is just as important, I've learned, to have a mixed slate of people who are doing the interviewing. If you have a mixed slate of men, women, you know, and, and genders and, yeah. and, and ethnicities, but all white guys doing the interviewing, you're still going to have a problem. Um, the, um, there's a respect gap between men and women. Uh, that's something that we need to be highly, highly aware of. A man and a woman who have exactly the same job title, the man actually gets more respect and has more power 
in the workplace. So that's something, again, we have to be aware of that to try and close that, um, that gap. Um, the differing ways that um, men and women communicate in the office, I think, are also incredibly important. Um, there's been some brain research that shows that because of the way male and female brains are wired, um, there's a misinterpretation that goes on. And one of the biggest is, has to do with men and emotion. Um, men, so women actually do cry more often than men. Young women cry, you know, significantly more um, than older men. Um, men in the office, when they see a woman crying, they generally think, oh my God, I've hurt her feelings. And you hear men saying, well, I'm afraid to like give her honest feedback. I can't give her feedback. I can't put her on this project, whatever, because she might cry. Like they're deathly afraid of tears. Um, two things about that. One is actually the research shows that, that men's testosterone level falls when women cry. So, so it's actually a threat to the man. Um, but secondly, he, he's wrong about why she's crying. When women cry at work, it's actually anger and frustration. It's not hurt feelings. And so there's just, we need to kind of understand that communication level better. So how should a man respond when a, how should a boss respond when, he, when a subordinate is crying? He should understand what it means. Okay, you're frustrated, you're angry, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. And acknowledge that as opposed to, you know, trying to like, you know, make her feel better. The, one other thing in terms of the communication is um, uh, there's just different ways that men and women um, communicate. Women, because even as children, uh, little girls are taught to play by, by you know, by being cooperative. Um, boys are taught to play by winning, playing games where they win. That translates into adulthood where women um, use a lot of these qualifiers. They're, they're, you know, I think, I believe, I hope, I just hope it's not too much trouble, and they use a lot of upspeak. And so I've been in news meetings where um, gas prices are rising, and a female um, reporter or editor will say, uh, will say, gee, has anybody noticed gas prices are rising? I wonder why that is. A guy will like bang the table and say, we need a story on gas prices. When the woman uses the upspeak I've seen very often, a man in the room will just start explaining to her, like the mansplaining thing. But she's not asking you a question, right? She's, she's making a statement. So it's really understanding the communications differences right. um, so that we can actually be better prepared to get along. And I'll, I'll mention... No, I need to interrupt your okay. knowledge with my confidence at this stage because we're running out of time. Got it. Um, so I might ask you, Gary, for one final 30-second statement and I'll let you have the last word being the woman on the panel. D yeah, maybe just one quick comment on the, on the brain and the hormonal mix that our bodies are very malleable and so it's also what, we t what we're taught. So boys who learn early on to use words for emotion, that we talk to our sons in more use of emotion, we can also change basically how our chemistry works and the, to, to the positive. So I think it's important to acknowledge these things exist in our bodies, but we're highly malleable if we're raised in different ways. It's, so yeah. we can make a better boy. It's called civilization. We do, yeah, we do <laughs> know how to do it, It's called education, civilization, yeah, exactly. and humanity. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah, and I would just say that, look, the, the, you know, the number one thing that we can do is make sure that we have men who are engaged in leadership. It is simply not enough for a leader of a company or any organization to offload this onto the HR department or anywhere else. It has to come from the top and it has to set the culture of any organization and that's how we will affect real change. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Thanks.